All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm here with Genevieve Hudson, the author of Boys of Alabama, um, one of my favorite books of the quarantine so far. Um, I asked them to come uh, speak about this book because I just I loved this book so much. I fell in love with it. And um, we were just talking beforehand about how exciting it is, you know, as much as I really miss getting to talk with authors in person at Keras and how much we love hosting authors, especially Southern authors who are expats living in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. Um, it is really exciting to get to do virtual author events. And so Genevieve, we're really excited that you're here. Um, Boys of Alabama is your second book, but your first novel. Um, and so I'm hoping you can start us out just by, you know, letting folks know what the book is about um, generally. And then if you would read um, the opening section for us. Yeah, um, and thank you so much, ER, for for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to to talk with you about the book. Um, this it feels like uh, this is the ideal space for me when I was thinking about like who my audience would be and the community that I care so much about in the South. So thank you for thank you for making this happen. Um, so like you said, the novel's Boys of Alabama. Um, it is set in Alabama, uh, and it tells the story of a, I guess it's like a coming of age and, and kind of in some ways a, a coming out story about a, a young queer uh, German high school student who immigrates with his family to a small town in rural Alabama. Um, and what he finds when he gets there are um, kind of contradicting worlds. He's pulled into one world where there's kind of a high, it's hyper masculine kind of a sense of toxic masculinity that's very infused with a love of football and an evangelical um, uh, kind of gifts of the spirit southern kind of Christianity uh, and in that world he he finds a, a sense of belonging and camaraderie that he's never really had before um, it really draws him in um, but he's equally drawn to this kind of gender queer witchy boy named Pan who represents another side of Alabama that he's being exposed to. And these two different um, elements of, um, of community, masculinity um, that he experiences in Alabama both pull him and speak to different sides of him. And it's kind of about how he reconciles with that and the truth that he's discovering about who he is. Yeah. Um... So will you read that first section? Because I think it really does set the scene so well. Yeah, I will. The boys are Alabama. They are red dirt and caked mud. They are grass stains on knee pads, names on the back of jerseys, field goals and fullbacks, Heisman trophies and touchdowns, a fat lip and a happy concussion. They are pine trees ripped up to make room for gas stations, stadium lights, drive-throughs, gridirons, and steel mills. Alabama wasn't built by them, but the boys swell with pride, a rabid and real thing, like peanuts planted in the fields that they can harvest. Their trucks roll over roots and through dry creek beds and their bellies bulge with the surplus of it. The grain and corn culled from the ground that God watered for them. Their muscles remember the past. They know how to gut a deer, how to slice a fish, how to tear cotton from the stem, how to tighten a fist in the middle of a house and lie. Rivers run fast in Alabama and sometimes is slow and sleepy as one of those rocking chairs abandoned on a porch where women used to sip sweet tea and wait. Wait for something that isn't coming because nothing comes to Alabama anymore except for you. Thank you. So I read that and I was hooked as I'm sure everyone who's listening now is gonna be hooked if they haven't read the book. Um, and I was looking for a number of reasons. First, your language is just gorgeous. Um, and it's it's oral as well as um, being writerly, you know, it's both. Um, and it's immediately Southern to me in its sort of imagisticness. Um, but it's also, you know, it's centering these boys in this way that I, I found really interesting, right? Um, and so I was thinking a lot about my own adolescence and childhood as a queer person as someone who was you know socialized as a girl 
uh, who grew up to be a man. And um, I was thinking about what it means to be an outsider observing mm -hmm. boys and masculinity. And so I was wondering if that was your experience, mm -hmm. um, because I think in some ways, uh, it was my experience that I was much more able to observe masculinity than the boys, the cis cisgender boys around me. Um, and I think you, you know, you can write so beautifully about it in part because you can see things that maybe men don't, um, uh, and cisgender boys can't. And so I, there's such a, there's such a mix of, there's a love letter to these boys and a very clear eyed indictment of the violence that they do. And I think those two things are, are, are right up on each other throughout this book. And they're right there on the first page of the book. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about sort of um, if that's true or not, uh, I don't want to assume, but also um, kind of how, how you thought about masculinity as you sat down to write this book. I, I think that's such a, a, a beautiful way of phrasing that question because it, it really speaks to kind of my experience and what I was hoping to um, to kind of get people to see or reflect on when they were reading. So I, I feel really like good knowing that that was your experience or that's what you, you saw when you were reading the book. I, um, I absolutely had the, a similar experience to you when I was growing up that I, or a similar experience to what you're speaking, speaking of where, you know, I was growing up and I really looked to, my close male friends who were really my, my community at the time to model to me, you know, what being a boy and what embodying masculinity looked like, you know, I would in some ways like study them and see like, how are you, how are you standing? How do you hold your body? How do you swim through the pool? You know, how do you eat a sandwich? What do your shirts look like? And these things felt kind of captivating to me because there was something mesmerizing about it that I, I hoped to embody and I felt like the proximity of that would in some way allow me to own own it as well. Um, and I, I actually wrote an essay for Elle magazine that came out and as this book was coming out that was kind of a reflection on the boys that kind of made me or shaped me, these three boys that I had very close relationships with as I was growing up. And how many reflecting on like the way that I looked to them and um, both, you know, kind of as you were speaking to, or at least, you know, I think approximating saying that like I at once sort of put them on this pedestal where I thought like there was like kind of beauty and intrigue and something aspirational about the way they were. And yet at the same time, I, I saw deep flaws and, a lot of you know inherent violence and these things that made this relationship to masculinity also frightening and toxic. And so how how do I hold those two things at once? And that was something I really wanted to explore in this book. And it felt really important to me because masculinity really was a huge part of my experience growing up. That really shaped so much of like my own adolescence and also the culture and community around me that I was like, I, I need to parse through this. I need to explore it. I need to really look at it in the way that you look at something when you're writing a book about it. Yeah. I mean, I, that comes through so clearly and I, it's literally the first time I've ever read a book where I felt like um, someone had had that very specific experience that I felt like was my childhood. So I'm very grateful to you for it because I was like, Oh, that's it. Like, it's that weird feeling of like, I really want this and I don't want that. Like, I don't want this specific yeah. version. Um, and I think that's that's the unique, unique thing about sort of queering gender, right? Is like, what can we take of masculinity or of different gendered embodiments, right? And and take and, and change it a little bit so that we're not we're not just like, you know, taking every aspect of it, right? And I think even the cisgender male characters in this book, so Max, who is cisgender, he's he's looking in part because he meets Pan and he's like, oh, there are other ways to be a boy. Yeah. Like, do I want to be this kind of boy? Do I want to be that kind of boy? Like, these boys' bodies are beautiful. These boys, like, have moments of being beautiful. So there's that, all of that is in there. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of like this sort of, I think a lot about sort of looking for possibility models, right? And it's like, his dad is actually like a pretty good possibility model too. And so um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, his parents. Mm-hmm. So Max's parents both seem um, atypical for mm-hmm. sort of coming of age novels and that they seem like utterly kind and decent folks, right? Um, so how did you you know think about his parents and particularly think about them as immigrants yeah you know um so i i wanted his parents to really embody this sense of you know they were coming along with him to a place that was new to them and yet maybe they had a little bit more of like a historical or like sociological context for like you know what what Alabama's history was and, you know, different kinds of global stereotypes for the American South. And they were coming from a place of, you know, being, you know, atheists, secular, and in some ways it was almost like, we're coming here and you're gonna, you're also gonna be exposed to different ways of living, take it as an educational experience. And I think Max, his rebellion kind of against his parents' more openness was towards something that to him felt like very exciting and very different because it was, it was antithetical to how his parents were, you know, there were, there were real like rules. There was real right and wrong of how you, how you did things. There was like a code of morality that was very black and white. And I think Max is the kind of kid who is dealing with a lot of self doubt, a lot of shame. And so to him to see like something that was very clear, like this is how you are redeemed this is what you do to um, become pure. And if you do these things, like not only will you have eternal love and acceptance, but this whole community will validate and accept you. And that feels really, really good. And I think as like a kind of lonely high school kid, like of course, like on a really deep attachment level, like that kind of unconditional love for your parents is extremely important, but maybe what you're looking for more readily to feel good in that day to day is like friends and, you know, validation from other people that you feel like you have to earn because they don't, they don't unconditionally love you yet. And I think that's what, that's what felt important about that, that parent relationship to me. Yeah, I thought that was so interesting. And I, I really was, um, I thought like the, the question of fundamentalism is really threaded throughout, right? And like, what is the draw of fundamentalism? Sort of like, what is the draw of toxic masculinity, right? And it's this, it is this question of absolute, right? And like the comfort of the absolute. And I think so often in media across the board, there's a real, and, w- and when people talk about the South, generally, there's this idea that like, people are just dumb if they're drawn to fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that really obscures the complex reasons why people are drawn to fundamentalism. It's like, there's, there's, there's a lot of complex needs that, that sort of send people looking for. Um, And it's not about a lack of intelligence, at least most of the time. Right. Um, And I, and I think that, that, that you do that really well in this book, there are a lot of different paths towards fundamentalism and it's not just the religious fundamentalism it's a lot of people just kind of trying to be like this is this and this is this um and so i wondered obviously like the religious fundamentalism is a big piece of this but i wondered if you kind of you know wrote the book you know all the way through and then went back in and added more stuff or if that just all came out organically with the the um aspects of like religious fundamentalism specifically yeah Yeah, I mean, that was always a topic that felt, it it holds a lot of complexity and mystery to me, like the idea of like religion and spirituality. And I think in this book, there is a lot of different avenues for people to kind of lean into spirituality. There is um, Pan, who has kind of like a more mystical, like witchy kind of spell, like of like casting spells kind of divining magic or inspiration from like whatever whatever it is that he's like drawing his power from and then you have kind of a a more grounded like grounded evangelical christian religion and then you have like the more gifts of the spirit like snake handling 
testing faith by drinking poison that's happening in like these church communities as well. And I think to me, like I wanted to show like all these kind of more mystical like ways that we could be like pulled into like questions and answers when it comes to the divine, but also see how like a dogmatic presence like could both like ruin some of that and also like make that have a lot of power for people because in some ways it like it makes it to me like it it justifies it in some way i think like the rules of like um when when um like i guess what i'm trying to say is like christianity especially like a more like gifts of the spirit christianity or evangelical christianity it is just as bizarre and like crazy sounding as like any kind of like spell casting like you know people who are like dealing with like witchcraft or magic it, it is i mean it's it it's like the belief that like a man died like thousands of years ago and that his blood literally like redeems you so that you don't go to a place of fire and snakes and instead to like a place of like peace you know but it becomes so so like spoken into like our everyday life and it becomes like the way that like christian language has become like part of like southern vernacular and like part of like southern politics like that was something that i i was like i have to talk about this like this is something that was so uh, my childhood was so marked by and as i grew up like i also like was very i had a moment where i was drawn to evangelical religion and you know, had a moment where I was very curious about what this would be like and was drawn to it and felt its kind of spell over me as well. So I think like to more, I kind of meandered there, but to more directly answer your question is I knew that that was something that that was going to be a big influence in the book. And then I do think that like, of course, while I was writing it, I like went back and I was like, where are places where I can make this more direct or where, where in the book can, can like, some of these like moments of like religious reckoning come to life a little bit more. Um, and so I would go back and kind of make sure that that felt like it was a, a, a red thread that was carrying throughout. So did you, did you grow up religious at all? Or was that, did, were your parents more like Max's parents? My parents actually, well, it's interesting. I would say they were, they were not like dogmatically Christian, but they also were not like my parents. So I grew up, going to Catholic school, actually. And my my mom was, my mom and my dad were both the kind of people that were like, yeah, we believe in God, definitely. But I didn't, it wasn't that kind of evangelical um, way of like really embodying Christianity where I saw that really infuse into every part of their day-to-day -day life. It was more a way of culture. It was kind of like we go to church on Saturdays and I mean not Saturdays. We go to church on Sundays because that's what we do and our friends are there and then we have social hour afterwards. And we all go to lunch. And that always seems like a little more a part of it than the actual church service. But yeah. it was a part of my life growing up definitely and you know until I moved away from the south, I I actually like I don't think I'd met anybody who didn't grow up going to church on Sundays. I, I really don't like anybody who was not raised that way, even if they'd kind of come away from it. That was just, I couldn't imagine another way of really being brought up. But it was actually when, when I was a little older, like 17 or 18, when I started to be drawn in to more evangelical religion. And it was really because of a group of people who I found kind of mesmerizing and thought that, that also their way of, interacting with their religion felt a lot more embodied than this kind of really, really like separate, like we just go to church on Sunday and that's it. Like I saw it come into all aspects of their life and they were really taking to heart this idea of like, you know, giving what they had to um, people who didn't have things and to like rejecting certain um, cultural norms. Like they didn't drink alcohol, like the ways that they were embodying religion felt intriguing to me because it felt outside of culture in some way. And I think I was always interested in things that pressed up against the mainstream, even though it seems odd to be attracted to like evangelical religion as something that seemed counterintuitive to the mainstream. In some ways, this group of people did. 
No, I mean, I've always thought that there's like a, a weird borderland of evangelical spirituality that feels really erotic also like that, like when you're talking about like being the, like the way that it's situated on the body and some of the language around it and some of the like, you know, the, the, you know, particularly like people who speak in tongues and all that kind of stuff where you're just like, oh, the spirit of God is in you and is taking you over and like that, all that kind of stuff. And like being, being so overwhelmed by God, like that, 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 that relationship to God has always felt so romantic to me as someone, someone who also grew up Catholic, like mm -hmm. it, that it's not, that was not my experience of going to church either. Right. And I think, um, that has always been interesting to me and I get why it's fascinating and I get why it's alluring, especially if you're like, you know, who, who around me at this age is, seems like they are living the most interesting and fulfilled life. Right. Which I think every teenager is kind of being like, you know, trying to figure that out. Um, and it is countercultural. Yeah. It, Cause it, particularly when you're a teenager, it's countercultural to care about anything deeply and to like show it. Um, yeah. and I think that's, I, I like one of the things that I really like in this novel is that there's a lot of passion in, in lots of different directions in all of these characters. So they're not, um, but it feels realistic. Like they're not, none of these kids feel, um, apathetic, even when they are maybe like not sure what to do or you know they 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 have struggles but they 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 feel very realistically invested in their own lives mm -hmm. um which felt refreshing to me and felt true um and in part because i think that's a southern thing too like they didn't feel like sort of ironically jaded <laughs> like like they felt like sort of removed from that sort of new york media context in which kids are supposed to be ironically jaded right yeah, I love that. I yeah, I love that you like felt that they were when you said like they were very invested in their own lives. Like I really felt that. I felt like both, especially Max and Pan, took their lives very seriously, and it felt like this kind of this way that I think it can be as a as a teenager, where like every decision you make, like especially big decisions, a lot of times it's the first time you're really making a big decision, and and you don't totally have a sense of like what the consequence of that is. You know, I remember, you know, when I was a teenager, a lot of times I would make a decision and really feel like this consequence is like, it's going to win the rest of my life. You know, I remember like it, once like this, one of my best friends got expelled from fifth grade and just thinking like his life is over. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And, but that, that was the sense that at least I had that like each day, each thing was, really like had these extreme stakes and i don't know maybe other younger people had like more perspective than i did on that but that was how it felt for me well i think no i i think it's very um per, i think it's very perceptive to remember that because i think it's very easy uh, the older you get to just forget that like how groundbreaking and important each new experience is when you're younger and i think it is because of media that we think that teenagers don't care about their lives, right? Like that is actually not, that's adults rewriting that narrative onto kids. It's not, that's not actually, when you talk to teenagers, that's, everything is a big fucking deal. <laughs> like it's, it's not, that's not real, you know? Um, but I think you don't see that that much in, you see it in YA, um, but you don't see it that much in adult literature um, that features teenage characters, right? Which is what this book is. And so I think that's um, that's what I found so compelling about it. It's like, yes, every single one of these decisions is serious for them. And they are actual literal life and death decisions in some cases too, um, which I think does, you know, add weight to them. So I'm wondering if you could read, um, you know, a next, a next selection that you want to read for, for folks so they can get another um, flavor Absolutely. Awesome. All right, I'll read about a page and a half of this. Uh, and this is where Max first um, really encounters Pan at this field party in the woods where he goes with the football boys. He's seen him before, but this is, he's, he's really intrigued this time. 
Later that night, the boys pushed a cooler off the back of a Ford pickup truck and carried it down a red dirt road. The night was tar black with stars punched into it. Something unsettled Max about the smells, like rotting wood, wet hair, and skin that burned and blistered. He tasted mud on the roof of his mouth. There was a strand of grass in his molars. Davis said, feels like we're walking on a dog's tongue, all teeth and heat and sweat. The sound was running roaches smashed beneath steel-toed boots and wind slapping at the bushes in the kind of deadened silence that only comes past midnight in rural parts of America. Country ballads lifted from the speakers somewhere in the darkness. A fire snapped. It guided the way like a door cracked open at the end of a hall. The field which belonged to Cole's father careened into black, black, for acres on either side. It had taken nearly an hour of winding down skinny roads with many right turns to get here. Nothing had been marked. The boys just knew the way. The boy Max rode with said, where are the ladies at? And Max had thought girls would be at this patch of bald earth that had been trodden down to something worn and grassless for socializing, for late night whatevers. A pit for fire had been a pit for fire had about a dozen boys from the team circled around it. No girls, a few logs, a shed with a broken window, a four-wheeler and some old barrels that looked like they were there for sitting. The same song from the barbecue was playing, or was it a different song? The chords were so full of longing. Max felt like he was right there beside the girl singing about her sexy man and his tractors and his fishing lines and his big red dogs. A boy named Price put his elbow on Max's shoulder and leaned in so he could whisper. The bill of his dirty cap edged into Max's forehead. Price said through a stutter, looks like someone brought the goddamn witch. Max has found, Max's eyes found an image on the other side of the fire. The shock of Pan and his fishnet Pan's legs were crossed at the knees and he sat on the back of the four-wheeler next to Lorne, whose hair was orange as the flames. Lorne's wide chest was covered in a camouflage shirt with a deer running across it. Lorne, the judge's son. Lorne was a sluggish and muscled boy who seemed to have as much personality as a, sun, as a blade of sun-dead grass. Nothing like a sinewy father whom Max had seen on the sideline of football practice, clapping and whistling, when Lauren had joined his father near the water cooler, Max had watched them huddle in what Max had come to recognize as prayer. Hands clasped to shoulders, heads bowed. Lauren prodded Pan with his hooded eyes. His lips opened and closed in something Max recognized as hunger. Lauren was quiet and cagey any time Max had been around him, but that night he seemed to have a lot to say to Pan. Pan stroked his own tuft of coal-colored hair as he listened to Lauren. His back was ramrod straight. He moved from his core with an elegance that seemed acquired from other worlds, movies maybe, or books on dancing. Max wondered if Pan was a dancer. He pictured him spinning in the middle of an empty room with four beautiful white walls. He might leap into the air and land spinning, or land in a split, or land on the tips of his toes. Max thought Pan would look beautiful in a room with four white walls because his features were so drawn and heavy and dark. There was something in them that sprung out like they were shouting the word, look. His mouth was red as a cherry pit, but that night it was painted even red redder. Max could see, or did he just remember, a black mole shaped like America beneath his left eye. I'll stop there. So I love that. And I, I, I love, first of all, like, every party I went to in high school was like outside. <laughs> you know, I was like, I don't think I went to an indoor party until I went to college. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that feeling, right? And you evoke that so well. Um, and the feeling of like expectation that something's gonna happen and then, you know, oh, there's no girls there. So then it's just like sitting around and all those kinds of things. But then Pan is the girl there basically. Um, and so I wonder, you know, if you could talk a little bit about one of the things that I think Pan's character is so interesting because Pan is this genderqueer person in this space. Um, and he grew up with all these football boys and he's allowed to be there, but his presence is 
somewhat uncomfortable, but not, it's, you know, not totally, he's not rejected. And so it's this, he occupies this very unique space. And I think one of the things that um, frequently happens in the South is that, you know, we sort of protect our, our own weirdos, right? And um, I think, I think Pan is sort of the living embodiment of that in this book. And so I wondered if you could kind of talk us through how you, how you created Pan, if Pan was there from the beginning, and also how you, how you thought about that aspect of his character. Yeah. Pan was always a big part of the story. And in fact, this, this story started really with a lot of knowledge I had about, or curiosity I had about Max and Pan's relationship and what that would look like and what that would look like in the context of, of Alabama. And then the rest kind of grew around that. Pan is always a really central character. And it was important to me that I did kind of showcase what I knew about the South that I grew up in, which is what you're saying, that there's a sense of protecting your own freaks and your own weirdos, even though I think the South can be quite unaccepting and really bristle at the idea of difference. I think there's something about Pan growing up alongside these boys that he was like family to them. You know, they, they saw him as like a, a young child. They welcomed him in to like, to their, to their friend group. And then, you know, there's a, a part in the book not long after what I read where one of the boys is saying, you know, my dad says that this is a phase. And someone else says, you know, he used to be preppy as a Boy Scout. And they kind of, they've seen Pan develop into himself. They've seen him step into this identity and they're not really sure what it's all about. They have some questions about it. They think it's weird, but on some deep level, he's part of them. So he's still allowed to exist in their community and they'll make some comments. But, you know, again, there's another part later on down the line where Max is observing them all at this fast food joint that they're eating at. And he realizes that, that Pan actually really fits in a lot better than he does. Pan knows how to speak their language. The way that they joke with each other is similar. They have the same way of, you know, kind of like even making like fart jokes or talking about whatever's around them in a way that feels a little elusive to Max and kind of confusing because he's like, well, wait, but Pan is so, so different and, and so unique in his own way. And yet there is a part of him that's very much the same as these boys because they're coming from literally the same place. Um, and so I think that it was, it, it became important for me to show scenes and aspects where Pan was very much at home in, in his home and where he was very much accepted by the, by the people he grew up around, um, even though he himself like rejected a lot of the customs and, and felt very critical of Alabama, he still, it, it, he still belonged there in some strange way. Yeah. Um... Mm -hmm. And, and in some ways, race functions similarly throughout this book. So Pan is Mexican-American, right? Puerto Rican. Um, Puerto, or, Puerto Rican-American. Puerto Rican, yeah. Um, and, he, and there's um, a black kid on the football team as well, who similarly has um, um, like a, you know, like his, his race is sort of like noted by the white kids on the team and like, they they sort of tokenize him and joke around with him but they also are like you're our black kid right like it's this way of kind of being like we're we're making this space for you it's an uneasy and uncomfortable space you know but but we but you're ours and it's like it's very interesting that way that like both whiteness and masculinity kind of are like if you're gonna like conform to our setup like we're gonna wrap our arms around you right and i think that um, that was interesting to me that, that it sort of, at least my, in my reading of it was that in both of those cases, both of them as sort of racialized beings, you know, sort of function the same way, I thought. Yeah, I, I think that's true. It's this, this sense that like you can play with us if you can conform to sort of like our white supremacist society, you know, if right. you fit into this then it's more about like the way you're going to move through culture and space and kind of validate our assumptions of how, how we should be, then, then like, then we, we accept you. Kind right. Of. 
like yeah as long as you play ball literally on our terms like right. yeah um and i thought that that was the that the nuance of that um was done really beautifully because it's just it's it's done in very few words um mm -hmm. but it's like this this is very clear and this is absolutely how this operates in every like rural high school in america right like the 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 few black kids in the class are absolutely sort of pigeonholed into these roles, right? Um, where it's like you can be popular, you can be homecoming king, but you absolutely are gonna have to ride on the fucking tractor and like be, be involved in all of this other super white bullshit, right? right. Um, so I think that, um, and then that's called progress, right? Without any interrogation, so often. So um, I think I I really appreciated that, and I appreciated. Max as a outsider and as a German person, his own sort of like uncertainty around what whiteness means in America, but then like really kind of being not like somewhat uncomfortable about what whiteness means in Germany, right? Because whiteness in Germany has its own context, right? So I don't know if you want to say anything about um, his his sense of himself and, and Germans, you know, sense of history and racial atrocity well it was i mean i think what felt important to me there is like to make this parallel actually about the way that like white people whether this is happening like in germany or the american south live with a sense of like inherited ancestral violence and that the way that you reckon with that or don't reckon with that oh like shapes the way that it stays in your body and is here inherited down to future generations. So I think Max at some point is becoming reflective of that as he thinks back on his past. I think at one point he wonders about what, what kind of man his grandfather was and what kind of a person he would have been if he lived in Nazi Germany and how much, how much of goodness is inherent in you and how much of it is shaped by like the people around you and the culture that you're in. And he doesn't quite have those answers yet be thinking about like what does that mean like what part of me is good and what part of me isn't what part of me has the capacity for violence because i come from this lineage of people with a great capacity for violence and at this in a similar way you know these boys in alabama like they're at least max isn't seeing the same sort of um reckoning or questioning of like this past but i do try to like reference through like scene and um different ex experiences there the way that these boys are um holding this like violence and was like spring-loaded in their body that they've inherited you know they know how to do these acts of violence even if maybe they haven't done them yet because it's something that's been passed down to them and like until they can really reckon with the past and you know what has happened like on their land and what their grandfathers and great grandfathers have done, like they can't really exercise that from themselves. So it's like trapped there. Um, and that was like a kind of a connection that was important for me that these like white bodies coming from different places, but found, you know, found together now, like have this similar sense of inherited violence. And, you know, what does that mean for each of them? How do they reckon with that? And, and what does that mean for for like, for themselves and their futures. I think that's so um, beautifully done and subtly done. And I think um, as more white authors really try to write about whiteness um, and the racial trauma of whiteness as part of our our literature, um, I hope that I hope that more folks will really think about it in the terms that you're thinking about it because I do think. Um, really thinking of thinking about racial trauma, inherited racial trauma for white people is a really important part of our story, um, our collective story as a country, but our collective story as white people, um, and how that is linked to masculinity, right? I mean, in the exact way that you're talking about, um, and and really kind of that mindless violence, right? Just the and the way in which it is, um, it's the first thing that violence is the first thing that we go to, right? It's like pre precognitive violence, like before anything else, before thought. Um, so I wonder if you could go to talk about the judge a little bit and kind of the role he plays and then maybe 
go to the scene that you had picked out about him? Yeah. So the judge is Lauren's father, who we were just introduced to in this um, last piece. And, and the judge is running for governor of the state of Alabama. He's a big political figure who um, is charismatic. He's magnetic. And he really believes that um, secular culture is threatening to wipe away um, the ethics and morals of the United States and especially the state of Alabama. And it's important to stay centered in this like really uh, this, this kind of Christian religion that's very based in um, kind of like the exclusion and, you know, propping up kind of like white culture under the vein of um, Christianity and acceptance. And he is um, uh, a big presence in this small town. And Max is the community of boys that he's a part of are really in support of the judge and are doing a lot of campaigning for him. So Max is introduced to the judge and is actually quite taken with him. I think Max does see the critiques of the judge and is a little afraid of him also, but there's something that's mesmerizing about the judge to Max. And I think a big part of it is that what we were talking about earlier, and that is that the judge sees things clearly in terms of right and wrong. And he seems in some ways that he has the power to absolve you. He has the power to redeem you and his acceptance feels very um, affirming in a really deep kind of visceral level that Max craves. Um, because Max does have a sense that there's something inside him that's very wrong and it's very off. So I think if he can be um, accepted by someone who is kind of as rigid and dogmatic and powerful as the judge, that it feels like there's this sense of true, um, true righteousness that can be gained. Um, so should I read a, a yeah? Judge? Okay. So I'll read a a few paragraphs from Max at the judge's campaign rally. We're going to pray for those who've lost their way. We're going to pray that God uses us as his warriors in this love lost world. Lord, boomed the judge's voice. God, use us as your army here on earth. We're building up an army and we will not be swayed by the ways of evil. We will be your face in government. We will do your will on earth as it is in heaven. This is Alabama, said the judge, a state for you, Lord God. And we are not great if we are not doing your will. Help us reach the hearts of sinners. Let us judge people on nothing but their love for you and how they reflect your will in our world. We will not stand by and watch the world take you from us. The judge got on his knees on the well-laid oak porch and Max almost expected a beam to shoot down from the heavens, light him up or smite him. Max wasn't sure which. He closed his eyes. Was that what prayer was? Just closing his eyes? He wasn't sure what was supposed to happen after that. No God spoke to him. But for the first time, he wondered if he could find a God in there, in the black silence of his own brain. He made his mind say, God? It was completely silent. He was alone with himself like always. Max squinted at the judge through his pretend prayer. It unsettled him to see this noble man on his knees mumbling to himself, and it moved him. Max wanted to get on his knees too, wanted to humble himself before something great. The judge began to shake, so Max closed his eyes. He didn't want to see it. The judge had the ability to change people. The bodies in the crowd had been changed. They shook and trembled in the same way the judge did. It was as if he possessed the power to twist and bend the will and the bodies of the people before him. Max wondered if the judge knew the limits of his own power. The judge's power reached out and grabbed Max. He felt the judge wrap around his beating pulse. Power entered him. Was that God? I have seen death, my friend, said the judge, quiet and slow. I have seen death, and I have seen the devil. I have looked him straight in the red of his eyes, and I am here to tell you that the way of the Lord is not easy, but it is good. The world is a battlefield, and the right path is not always kind, but it will make sense in the end. 
God never promised us ease. He promised us love. He promised us himself in exchange for eternal life. Commit yourself to him. Be free. The prayer ended and people were released back to their conversations, but some strange and unsettling thing roiled through the bodies beside Max. One man began to act hyper, laughing too loud and spitting flecks of chewed burger onto the faces of the other men while he talked. Max wondered what it was the judge just did to everyone. He wondered because he felt it too, the surge of cortisol cruising his veins, swelling them thick as they could go. Maybe that's what God was. Maybe God was power. Max wanted more of it, whatever it was, even though it scared him. Scared him in the way drugs scared him. Scared him the same way as when a girl at school smashed a plastic bag of Ritalin into dust and licked the bag until it was a slick sack of saliva and the girl's teeth began to grind. The moon remained out even in the daylight, a moon so bright the sun couldn't wipe it away. Max concentrated on its craters, the blemished and intricate topography he could trace from the backyard. He may not understand silence, but it still made him feel small. On his way out, the judge walked past Max, stopped, raised a finger above him and drew it through the air and touched Max's chest. With that gesture, Max felt like the judge had taken some of the sky and put it inside his body. He expanded into blue. People like you, he said, are the people we need here. People like your father are doing good things for our economy. Cars are Alabama's biggest export right now. You need to invite him to church. We would love to see y'all come and celebrate the good news. The good news, said Max. Jesus has risen, son, said the judge. I'll stop there. So I think um, what I love about that is like, there's such a condescension, like we were kind of talking about earlier, towards fundamentalism, right? And towards people like Donald Trump and like anybody who is at all drawn to that is just an idiot. And it's like, it's very tempting to just dismiss that, right? And be like, you know, anyone who's drawn to that sort of charismatic um, church or charismatic politician um, is, you know, is, is less intelligent. And I think one of the things you were saying is like, there's a real there's a real pull to particularly when you're young, but particularly when you're uncertain at any point in your life, right. Towards someone who can be like, these are the good guys. Those are the bad guys. Here's what you need to do with your life. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's so, that's so much what Max is looking for as a young person. And is particularly as someone who has this like soul wound who feels like he's really damaged. Um, but I also think, you know, so often on the left, like we're like, you know, Here's a here's a 500 page paper about the state of the world. It's really complicated, and no one's actually right or wrong, right? Like we we're like very nuanced about it. And then over here, you've got like you've got somebody just telling you very simply what to do. And I think um, there are lots of work branding. Yeah, we have a very big branding problem on the left, and um, and so I get I'm often really interested in that. Like, how do you use the the pull? of the right for good right like take the take the the pieces of charismatic fundamentalism but then use them for for positive means right and i don't know if that's possible but i do think um that sort of certainty because i think the world requires nuance right so like it's it, that's the tr that's the trouble but like i do think i think humanizing that desire is the first step right like humanizing the reasons why people want to be told what to do and why they want didactic leaders mm -hmm. is really key because I think certainly since you know 2016, all of these pundits have just been like, "Well, anybody who voted for Trump's an idiot, right?" And it's like, well, that's certainly not going to convert anyone. Right? Um, and so I feel like this book goes a, does a lot to sort of humanize that impulse. Um, and I wondered if that was a conscious choice or if that was just something that came naturally to you as you were writing. Um, I think that I just relate, I relate to it. I mean, and so I think that's why maybe it came naturally to me and also why I felt like it was an important thing to write about because I, I do see the draw of a black and white, more collapsed way of looking at the world. But the, the truth is, is that for me, it wasn't sustainable. You know, the reason that I couldn't stick it out and, 
a more kind of woo-woo evangelical kind of Christianity, like even though this brand of fundamental Christianity that I was being pulled into was not necessarily filled with the same people who'd be voting for Trump. I mean, they were, they were pretty alternative in their own way and kind of radical in terms of, you know, like what they, what they ate and, you know, they were straight edge and they were like really living kind of more fringe like lives. And yet at the same time, they, they still did, it did necessitate a certain kind of black and white thinking because you really had to believe that the tenants that you espoused were absolutely true, you know? And if you believed really that a literal interpretation of the Bible and it was absolutely true, you really had to forsake nuance. And, and at the end of the day, like I couldn't do that because there were too many questions I had around science and experience and pain and uh, other countries and other kinds of religion and culture and cultural relativism and all this stuff that I couldn't reconcile. I couldn't shut that out long enough to really sit in the goodness of how it felt to just believe something. I mean, to really just believe like this is the way it is, even if it's hard, even if a lot of other people don't believe it, even if it sounds crazy, I believe this and all these people around me validate that belief. And because they're also validating this belief, we have a special bond because it's us against the world. And that is, I have not been able to find that kind of community since I left Christianity because I don't think you can really have it because I think that that kind of depth of, of community and belief of like really unshakable bond comes from believing at all costs that this is the right, that you guys got it right. You know, yeah. and no matter if the world's against you, you have it right. And so I think like what you're saying is true that maybe there is no way that more nuanced thinking can really use that way of, of relating to the world because it doesn't work in some way, you know? So it's harder to establish the same kind of community and yet like you can't really use it. One of the losses. Yeah, I, this may be a strange parallel, but I um, I have the same feeling at heterosexual weddings where people are like, I know that we're in this forever and our love is gonna last and like we're gonna be married for 50 years as I did in my maternal grandparents' church, which is a very Southern Baptist, like Hellfire and Brimstone Church where everyone like clearly really felt the spirit. And I remember even as a little kid wanting that like wanting that faith and being like really, even as a like six year old grieving and knowing like that, I would never feel that. And not in some like superior way, but just being like, I, I don't think I can access that. And, you know, and I, in the same way that I can't access like whatever magic certainty that straight people seem to have about the, <laughs> the strength of their unions. Like, and so I, I think about that sort of outsider status of like, what it means to be on like you know to to have a perspective like i think one of the gifts of queerness is and even the gifts of transness right is to to be and obviously many binary trans people feel that they are one or the other right but like as a non-binary trans person like i feel like one of the gifts of my queerness is that and my transness is like i can see both sides of things i can see that like you know, there are positives and negatives to all gender expressions, right? There are positives and negatives to like all of these different expressions of how human beings are in the world. Um, but then that means that you don't get to belong anywhere wholly. Yeah. And I think, I think longing, lo that longing is very pronounced. Um, and I, I appreciate, you know, that longing, that thread of longing is just throughout this book in so many different directions. And it's like, what's the trade off for being perceptive or well, maybe it's that longing um i don't know <laughs> that's a beautiful way of saying that and i i relate very much to it because i i think i have always really envied people who had a strong sense of certainty and i i i think that's true it's like even when i think about my own queerness in relation to you know what the way i was talking about religion too is 
that it does seem to be something that's always shifting and that always has nuance and that I can't ever feel totally certain about. And that's part of what also makes it beautiful, but it also is an exhausting thing to see so much like nuance to things and to feel like, you know, there is a way that people who have like true certainty in something can also rest because I think they have a sense that like, it's not going anywhere. There's a stable foundation and they can kind of put aside doubt because, or live with the doubt and not feel like the doubt has to make them shift in any way. But to me, like the doubt is an activating thing because it makes me think that there might be more out there and that there, there is, there are other ways of, of being and other ways of showing up that, that feel like equally like true and beautiful. And I think that like also part of that is like not wanting to miss out on those experiences and that like sense of knowledge. So to me, like the pursuit of, of like a more expansive nuanced truth is always going to win out over like a, a sense of like certainty because I, I can never settle into that even if I wanted to. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, so I'm always curious, like, is, which is the bigger life, right? And I, I think I think that what you're talking about is choosing the bigger life, ultimately. Like, is this gonna lead to more things? Is this gonna lead to more interesting things, even if they're painful, right? Like, but but isn't that isn't that what we're here for? I don't know. Um, so we have a question from Amanda, uh, and actually it leads into um, where I wanna go next, which is about craft. So Amanda asks, what are a few of your favorite Southern writers or books about the South? Which is a great question. That is a great question. Um, you know, there are so many great books, I think, coming out about the South right now, even too. But like a, a book that like is so close to my heart that like when I think about Southern literature, um, I always have to share is um, Bastard Out of Carolina by Dorothy Allison and also Trash her short story collection, Dorothy Allison is someone who's like voice and language, like really embodies the the South to me. And like, I think even though like those books were written decades ago now, like there's something that feels like a modernized version of like coming from like Faulkner and Flannery O'Connor um, who, uh, and Eudora Welty, who are also like Southern writers whose style, I think it really imprinted on me as a, as a writer and thinking of like, how I think about language and eccentricity and how like uh, landscape influences character and kind of the darkness that can kind of like creep under it all. Colors, also a Southern writer who I like kind of, who, who amazes me and like the way that they have written about the South. Um, yeah, so I would say I will, I'll, I'll stop there, but I am reading another book that's like not set in the South, but it, it's by a, a writer from Alabama. I'm sure a lot of people here have heard of it now because it's everywhere, but Brandon Taylor's Real Life. It's a really beautiful book and also um, Prettiest Star by Carter Sickles. Um, yeah. Um, we got to talk to um, Carter. Carter's an old friend of mine, so I got to interview him a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago now. Um, such a great, similar to you, like, such a really beautiful and illuminating book about the South in a, in a different way. But um, yeah, well, you just named so many of my favorites. Uh, so, and I, and I see all of their influence in your writing. I mean, I think that um, what I love about Dorothy Allison is just that she, that, that tenderness and violence sit right next to each other, you yeah. know? Um, and I think that's true in your work too, that it's like, that those things are that those things are close cousins, um, and then actually you can kind of only really, really hurt somebody that you love, right? And I think what you see in in Max and Pan's sort of negotiation of their relationship is like, do we love each other enough to really hurt each other? Yeah. Um, and um, and I think that kept like that was sort of I kept waiting to see like, oh, how bad are they going to hurt each other? Like, do they really like? how deep is their caring for one another? Like, is it, do they like each other enough that it's really gonna be bad, right? Like I was like braced for the crash. Um, yeah. But I think I think that's a good um, sort of a, for me, like a good metric of like how how invested in characters I am 
because it's like, oh, I'm I'm really sort of clocking this and and bracing <laughs> for the for the possible uh, fall. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about sort of how you came to be a writer? Yeah, you know, I came to be a writer in in a, in a way that I bet a lot of writers came to be a writer, and that's through being a reader. I loved books when I was growing up. I was always reading them. They were a sense of escape for me from the town I was growing up in. They showed me what was possible in the world. They they were worlds of other possibilities and I was captivated by them. And I also was really mesmerized by what I saw as like an almost magical ability for authors to be able to tell me something that I was feeling that I felt was so it was private and special only to me, you know, to say a line or to hint at an emotion or experience that was so resonant and yet felt so private. Um, I, I thought that was like the most wonderful thing and it made me feel so much less alone. And I think my aspiration has always been to be able to do that. I think that's what I'm always kind of trying to do as a writer is like, how can I make, how does my specific experience like speak to someone else's? And can I make that connection like across pages, across distance, you know, from writer to reader that always felt like the most kind of special and, and amazing point of connection and I think that's what drove me to do that and also as a way just to kind of parse through and understand the world that I was living in to, to try to bring it to life in a way that kind of gave it meaning and allowed me to understand and make sense of things. So your first book was a short story collection and um, was it um, was it something that you wrote as part of a thesis or was it something that you sort of built over time? How did that come to be? So some of the stories were um, from my thesis, but I think only like one or two of them actually. A lot of them kind of grew out of um, the years after I finished graduate school. And um, a lot of them take place in the South as well. And I think that it, it was a lot about like thinking about like place and thinking about like what home was. They're very centered around this like I know pe people are main characters who are sort of searching for home, whether that's an actual physical place or a sense of home in their physical body. Um, and some of the story, I would say about three or four of the stories were written after um, the, my publisher kind of what we were already like, kind of, he, he asked to publish the book and then some of them were written and kind of edited alongside him as well. And, and the well, that's a, that's that's sort of an unusual experience for some, like to have that sort of companionship that early in a, in your career was that, that seems like that would be a good, a positive thing. Was it? Yeah, it was, it was, this was like, this was, um, um, the, the book was put out with future tense, which is an independent press that's based in Portland, Oregon. Um, and the publisher had kind of known my work, my publisher and editor had like known my work for a while and, had kind of reached out to me before about like maybe publishing a collection and he reached out and was like, so do you have any stories that you want to bring together into a collection? And I showed him what I had and he was really excited about a lot of them. And he was like, let's kind of, I would love to see, you know, three or four more stories in here too. Like let's work on some. And so I wrote those and, and then he kind of edited them as well. And that became the collection. And I actually like think that some of the later stories that I wrote um, ended up being some of my favorite that went into it. So it was, I think there was some sense of momentum there after like feeling that the collection had a specific voice and that I could write in and kind of like lean more into that gave me a kind of permission to, um, to write in a way that ended up being really um, uh, exciting. Do you, how did your, um, how did your novel first begin to take shape? Was there, so you said that Max and Pan were sort of the, the initial like, thing that hooked you was there was there a specific place that you began yeah I you know the actually that scene that I read uh second it was the one where like there's the party the outdoor party the field party and Max is seeing Pan that was the first real scene I wrote in the book and I think there was something about the language that came out there that allowed me an in into it it was the way I was seeing the the field, the way I was like thinking about the boys, this sense of like 
kind of communion that they shared and this kind of haunting darker landscape. And I just really remember feeling like as I wrote that scene, like this is, there's something here that I really, really like want to explore more. There's something here that's the start of something bigger. Um, and it just, it grew from there. That's always amazing. I always love hearing sort of the the root or the origin of how how a book grows from something because I think it's so idiosyncratic, but like you can always sort of feel it, right? Like whatever the the nucleus of a book is, it's usually like it makes sense. Um, so I love that. Um, do you want to talk about what you're working on now, if anything? Yeah, I you know it's it's interesting. I I was actually. Um, commissioned to write two different pieces for art books, which is kind of a, they weren't related at all, but um, that was kind of a fun project that I've been working on in the time since my book got published. One is um, actually a like a set, it's, it's by like a Danish artist who is documenting the, um, the transition of um, like a early 20s Danish woman. And um, he asked if I would write a, uh, the artist asked if I would write a short story that kind of did not actually speak to the experience of this, of this person, but like would be able to act as kind of a spiritual companion piece. And so I was working on that and that was a really fun and interesting project because I, I really got to kind of study this like photo project and learn about this person's life, not to write about it, but in order to sort of write something that I felt like spirit had spiritual affinity. Um, and then coincidentally, I was asked to do something similar for another art book. So sometimes things in the universal line like that. But um, I also have, have started a new novel. It's in the very early stages of it, but um, it it's also set in the South again. It's about two queer friends who are taking a, road trip down from New York where they live to um, the college town where they grew up in the South or where the college town where they went to where they met um, for a friend's wedding. And it's this experience of like returning to this place where they had so many formative experiences. And yet they've both really grown um, in their identities and have kind of like a shifting sense of what that means. And it's kind of about their friendship and, and this return. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, well, that's very exciting. Yeah. So, um, do you do you have any uh, writerly advice that you like to give people? Um, you know, I would say like for for um, for writers out there that are either starting out on their journey or just kind of like looking to deepen, I I think that there is a way of um, I, I don't know, maybe this sounds like a little bit like woo woo too, but like, I believe like in the sense of like rich ritualizing your writing practice and setting a lot of intention into what it is you're writing. I think that like, it's really easy to get like bogged down by uh, doubt or um, like overthinking things. And I think that there's like a way to really like open up a sense of like a, almost like a, not channeling in the sense that like your whole story is going to just be like downloaded from like some other place, but like a sense of like really opening up to that sense of your own like creativity and potential and to like believe in like your own power really to like tell a story that nobody else can tell because we all have such unique and marked consciousnesses and ways of being in the world and believing in your own like vision and ability to like see the world and distill it. And I think to then translate that into action by like by ritualizing what you do. And by that, I mean, like setting time, however often that is for you, whether that's like daily, whether that's biweekly and telling yourself like this is when I'm going to write 500 words. This is when I'm going to write a thousand words and allow yourself to to like to fulfill that each time and to to keep going. And you're going to sustain a momentum that like that becomes something, you know, if you sit down at the, the page like every day or in a really like routinized way, you're, you're going to create work and what's there is going to have some beauty in it. And you're going to be able to start shaping and making things from that. That's such good advice. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so, so this has been amazing. Um, do you, is there anything that you want to share that we didn't get to? 
No, I think you asked such like really wonderful and comprehensive questions. I, I feel really grateful for the chance to get to talk to you. So thank oh. you so much. And thank you for, you know, reading, reading the book with such, um, like curiosity. I really saw the the questions you asked were really like some of the best ones that I've gotten so far. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you. I mean, what you were talking about, about wanting to be a writer so that, uh, you could like, you know, share your, your sort of innermost secrets with someone else and have them get it. It's like this book, like hit all of these very specific experiences for me. So I, it, it deeply resonated with me and I suspect that it will deeply resonate with many, many more people. So, um, I'm really excited. It's out in the world. I can't wait to read everything else that you write. Um, and I hope that you'll get to physically come to Karis whenever this pandemic is over. Um, yeah. yeah, but until then, be well um, and wish wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, ER. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.